Kings, and uh, I thought I'd be taking sections of 15 verses or something, but I can see this is going to go slowly going through here. Today I'm going to cover verses uh, 2 through 4, and the title of my message is Trials Have a Reason. Okay, but before then, I have a humorous anecdote. Ha, there, huh? I changed the name of it. It's not a morning joke, it's a humorous anecdote. How many of you have iPhones? How many of you use Siri? How many of you have gotten Siri, or Siri has gotten you so mixed up and given you bad things? <laughs> Siri never gets it right, or does she? Here's a true story from the Reader's Digest. You know, I went to the library yesterday. Eugene always goes and gets some wrestling videos and stuff like that, and and I asked him, are you getting rid of a bunch of old Reader's Digest? Because I like I like the humor in uniform, life in the United States. They always got a bunch of jokes in the Reader's Digest. There, This comes from the Reader's Digest. After I messaging back and forth with my wife, a husband is writing this, I jokingly commanded Siri to pass along this message. You need to get back to work now. You have a husband to support. Here's what Siri sent. You need to get back to work now. You have a has-been to support. <laughs> I don't know if Siri did get that wrong or not. <laughs> All right, so let's get into our message. Before we get into this, we're going to talk about trials. We all know what trials are. Now, a trial in the literal sense is where you go to court and maybe a jury, but the evidence is presented, you know, and, and you get tried. But we know that we use that word, and the Bible uses that word in the same way. The Bible uses it in the sense of going through a difficult time in life, okay? Here's what I want you to do. I want you, to, I don't want the story behind it, but I want you to just go ahead and shout out some trials, some areas in which you were tried, some trials that you went through in life. Go ahead. What are some of them? Breakdown. Oh, what else? Unemployment. Unemployment. All right, what else? Injuries. Injuries. Yeah, what else? Death in the family. Uh, in the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you've had on Facebook. It was how many years ago? Oh, like 35. 35 years ago. Yeah, yeah. One time we were watching a little girl from, yeah, I said I don't need the story, but we were watching a little girl from uh, a, a, a lady in the church, a poor lady in the church, and it was, so we lived out at my, near my dad's barn, and the little girl fell off a beam in my dad's barn, broke her leg, and then um, we got sued, and our insurance company says, well, your wife was, was, was doing a business pursuits by babysitting, so we're not going to cover her. Yeah, oh, oh, you know, so... We, go, we all go through trials of various kinds. So we're going to talk about those trials. What should our attitude be? What should our, our viewing of God be as we go through these trials? Well, here's our text for today. I will read that aloud. You follow along with me. We, we covered verse 1 last week, so beginning at verse 2. James says to this to his readers, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials, there's our word, trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces, I have the ESV here, the ESV translates it steadfastness. Many translations translate it as patience, okay, produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. All right, here's my outline. I got four A's for us today. Four A's. Here it is. Your attitude towards your trials. I hope you picked up uh, one of my pretty blue hard uh, outlines here that you can fill in out there. The Laurel had been running something off for the kids, and, and uh, when I went to print, this paper was in there. I thought, oh, that's kind of nice paper. I just left it at that. So, uh, Your attitude towards trials. B, the Lord's aim in giving trials. C, your actions in trials. What are you supposed to do in them? And then D, your altering from those trials. I had to come up with an A. And we are changed by those trials. So I said, you're altering 
from those trials. All right, so let's jump into this. Point number one, your attitude towards trials. Now, think about it. When you go through trials, usually we get upset. We may feel hurt. We may feel angry. We may feel depressed. We, we have usually some kind of negative response to those trials. Well, James saw this in the Christians that he was writing to. He saw their attitudes in them. So James says something that's outrageous. James says this. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Whoa, that is a radical statement to say. We don't want to count it Oh boy, I hope I get into an automobile accident. Yay! You know, we don't count it joy when we go through those. Just a couple of things that we see in here. Some things that we notice in this verse. Number one, uh, when you meet trials, not if you meet trials, we will run into trials. They will come, different forms, different kinds, but they will come. Meet, think about that word meet. Trials will naturally meet you. It's kind of a picture of the Christian walking along in his daily Christian life, and then all of a sudden, a trial comes walking up from the other way and meets him, you know, and jumps into his life and begins to affect him. We meet trials. Sometimes they may come because of, of our sin, sometimes because of somebody else's sin, Sometimes it's not from sin at all. Remember, <coughs> there was a blind man, and his disciples saw him, and uh, the disciples said to Jesus, hey, did this guy sin? This guy's blind. Obviously, it must have come from some sin or something, they thought. And they said to Jesus, did this guy sin, or did his parents sin? You know, that was a wrong assumption. Sometimes trials just come in our life. They just come. It wasn't your fault. You didn't cause it to come. They, come, they will come in various forms. James says, trials of various kinds, all different. That's why I had you speak out. There was a lot of different kinds of trials that we face. They come in various forms in our life, and we usually don't like them. Though they are trials to test us, that's what the word trial means. If you study the word trial in Scripture, the word trial doesn't mean the Lord sends this into your life to see how you're going to react. Sometimes it's that way. But the Lord wants to mold you and shape you and allows this trial to come in your life, not just to test you, but to shape you. I am an instructor at several different universities, colleges, and I often give tests. Now, when I give a midterm, I give a final, that is to test them, the students, to see how much they know, whether they've been studying or not, whether they know the material. But when I give weekly quizzes, my weekly quizzes aren't for the purpose of testing to see whether they've gotten in there. My purpose for weekly quizzes is a learning experience. In fact, I allow them to retake my weekly quizzes. And you say, whoa, that's radical. Won't they get them all right the next time? Well, that's the purpose. The ones they get wrong, they'll look up, they'll find the right answer, and they will have learned, you know? So trials are not just for the sake of testing us, but they are for teaching and molding and changing our lives. Let's go on. I want to talk about that word count. James says, count it all joy when you fall, when you meet various trials. Count it. Well, it comes from the Greek word, um, hegiomai. Huh? How's that for a Greek word? Hegiomai. Now, here's, its, here's its, its basic meaning. It means to take the lead to govern. Sometimes um, the governor of various provinces took on the title. Now, this is the verb form. Hegiomai, but they had the noun form in the Greek. The governor, ruler. It means to rule over something. Isn't that an interesting meaning? Now, in this sense here, um, 
Greek scholars tell us it means to consider, to count, to esteem. To, we might use the word, if you're from south, uh, reckon. You know, you need to, Paul says, you need to reckon yourself dead unto sin. We need to count ourselves. James says we need to count ourselves, or we need to count it joy. Now, I like that basic root meaning, to govern or to lead. James tells us we are to take the lead over our attitudes, and I could substitute the word emotions there. We need to take the lead and govern our emotions and count it, reckon it, just consider it joy that we are going through these trials. Whoa! That's something to think about, huh? We are to count them, esteem them as joy. I wonder how well we do that. I usually get grumpy, and I usually get yell at my wife, and I usually just feel down when I'm going through these trials. And um, do you ever, let me ask you something. Do you ever talk to yourself? I have found, I know you might think this strange, I have found that a good practice to do in my Christian life. Um, you go back to the, to the um, Psalms, and many times the psalmist says, Oh, my soul, you know, he, he talks to himself. And I have found it helpful in my Christian life to talk to myself. Most of the time, it's after I've yelled at somebody or I've been angry or a stupid driver who did such and such or wasn't going quite fast enough down the road. He was obeying the speed limit, but I didn't feel like obeying the speed limit, you know? So, and I, uh, so I have to stop myself and I say, John, you need to stop that. I literally say that to myself out loud. Usually not when anyone else is around. But I usually say, John, you need to stop that. That is counting, taking control over, governing. And that's what we need to do with our emotion, our attitude towards the trials that have come into our life. Here's what you need to say to yourself, okay? You're going to talk to yourself. God loves me so much that he saved me and now wants to grow, and James particularly picks out one particular character attribute. We go to Galatians 5, and Paul gives us, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. There's a whole, whole bunch of them that can grow in our lives. James particularly picks out the word, steadfastness. So you can say to yourself, now God wants to grow steadfastness in my life. Now, as I said, many translations translate that with the word patience. But I want you to think about the word steadfastness or steadfast. What does that conjure up in your mind? Being steadfast. I think of a great big guy, maybe maybe like Alan or Mike, and they stand there and they brace themselves. And no matter how much Pastor Herrick comes running up to them and he jumps and he bounces off of them and Pastor Herrick goes crawling all over the ground, they are still standing there steadfast. Huh? There's a, there's a good word picture for you, steadfast. God wants to grow steadfastness in my life. Notice the quotes. You're still talking to yourself. So my heavenly Father has allowed this trial to come into my life, to come into my life for me to grow from it. Tell yourself that. This trial, the Lord has allowed to come into my life to grow my character, to grow steadfastness in my life. Still quotes, when I consider how much my Heavenly Father loves me, it brings me joy. Okay, I'm going to give you three minutes to, to memorize this, and then you're going to have a quiz over. No, no, I won't do that. But this is, this is good for you to, to, to say to yourself, God loves me. God has allowed this trial to come into my life to grow steadfastness in me. 
James says, count it all joy when you fall into trials because God wants to grow patience in your life. Here's a cross-reference. Hebrews 12, 2. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. Remember, all a list of Old Testament saints who had faith. Verse 1 says, seeing we are compassed about by such a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race, oh, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of faith. Now, notice this next phrase. This is mind-shattering. Jesus is going to the cross. He's been arrested. He's been flogged with a cat of nine tails. His back is bleeding and laid bare. He has a crown of thorns thrust into his head. They're laying him down on the, on the cross with wooden spikes ready to pound into his hands and his feet. And it says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, Jesus didn't think the cross was fun. Jesus didn't take joy in having to go through the pains of the cross. But Jesus knew the outcome. Jesus knew that he was going to redeem mankind. Jesus was going to redeem those who would place their faith and trust in him. And so though the joy doesn't come from the cross, the joy comes from the outcome, the results of the cross. Jesus had joy in knowing that mankind had redemption, who for the joy that was set before him. James says, the outcome of this trial is that the Lord is molding and shaping you, growing steadfastness in your life. You need to take joy in that. All right, the Lord's aim in giving trials. Now, I know we've already kind of talked about that. But it says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Huh? Um, steadfastness, patience, comes from the ancient Greek word, Hupomone, in this case, the, the, real, the, real, the root of that word is hupomeno. Now, the Greeks like to take and put prefixes on the front of words and make a wonderful word picture out of them. I can't remember. Who is it? There's a, a well-known Christian author who talks about, like the husbands and wives, when you really want to communicate with your wife or you really want to communicate with your husband, use a word picture, they say. Who, uh, remember who that is? Yeah. Gary Smalley, yeah, that's who it is. He's the guy who talks about word pictures. Well, this word is a word picture. The, word, the, the prefix on the front of there, hoopo, you've heard of that. It means to go under. They have two prefixes, hooper, which means to go over, hyper, hyperactive, you know, comes over in English, or hypo, a hypodermic needle goes below the skin to inject you hypo okay so they, they literally the prefix under with the greek word meno that means to stay abide or remain a, a, a important theological word you go to john chapter 15 and the whole chapter is about abiding in christ he's the branches he's the vine we are the branches and we are to abide remain in him. The whole chapter talks about abiding in Christ. Well-known Christian, book, here again, the author. Abiding in Christ was a well-known Christian book. Who's the author of that? I can't remember. Um, an important theological word, but here James puts it on the word um, meno, puts hoople on the front of it, and it literally means to remain under okay so we got a word picture here wonderful word picture look up in that upper corner and you see that poor donkey with a great big heavy load on his back but he is staying there and going to do his job of carrying that load for his master 
It has a picture of someone under a heavy load and choosing to stay there instead of trying to escape. Um, so you, that's the word that's translated in the ESV here as steadfastness, sometimes translated as patient. Huh? I come up behind that stinking red light, and I think the red light is broken because it takes uh, an eternity to change green, and I'm wanting to go, and I've got my foot on the accelerator, just waiting there, watching, and all of a sudden, finally, after an eternity goes by, it changes green, and I, you know, I think, uh, if that's my attitude at a green light, how much, or at a red light, I should say, how much patience do I really have in my life? Huh? Being willing to remain under a trying load. That's what the word is there. God wants to grow that characteristic in your life. There are people who their marriage is going through a tough time and rather than endure, rather than stick with it, rather than deal with the problems, rather than work the problems out, they say, forget it, I'm out of here. I wonder how many pastors, when their church is going through some difficult time or something, and they just had a rough Sunday on Monday morning, they sit down at their desk and they write out their resignation. They want out of here because the load is too heavy, it's too trying, it's too difficult. We need to be willing to remain under that heavy load. So the Holy Spirit who indwells us will use the trial to build our character, to build steadfastness in our life. All right, cross-reference here. Peter talks about that. Not only does James talk about trials, by the way, he's going to come to the topic. Kind of interesting as you read the book of James, he picks up a topic just a little short quip about it here and then a little bit more in another chapter and a little bit more a little bit later and he does that with almost all of his topics he'll come back to going through trials again later in the book we'll talk about that but peter talks about that too peter gives us a different word picture peter says this first peter chapter one verses six and seven <coughs> In this you rejoice. Hey, that sounds like he read the book of James. Huh? James was written before 1 Peter. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Huh? What's he talking about there? may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, here's what Peter's talking about. Peter refers to the process of gold being purified. When you get gold out of the ground, it is gold ore. It is mixed with all kinds of other impurities. In fact, nowadays, they, they, they are looking for little specks of gold out of a, you know, a cubic yard of, of dirt out of the ground. Um, Peter refers to the process of gold being purified by melting. Um, metal will melt at a high temperature. Uh, dirt and stuff does not. Um, as it turns to liquid, the gold, the impurities will rise to the top and they are scooped off, leaving refined, purified gold. So if Peter gives us a word picture, you are going through trial as if it was a very hot fire because God wants to take the impurities, the dross out of your life. That's why we go through difficult times. All right, point letter C, your actions in the trial. What are you supposed to do when you're in the midst of them? Well, James has already said you need to count it, consider it, take control over your emotion and count it as joy. But now he's going to kind of hit the negative end here. He says this, and let steadfastness have its full effect. Now, this is a command, right? So what he is saying is when the Lord brings a trial into our life, 
to grow us, to build patience, to build steadfastness in our life, depending on how we respond to that, it, well, how did I say that? I said this, how we respond to trials will affect the way and how much they change us. If we respond in a negative way, we can, in fact, did I say that? Did I say it here? Yeah. We, I, I like this word. Do you ever think of the word, I can't even say it, thwart? The TH sound and the W go together, the AR. We can thwart God's building steadfastness in our life if we have the wrong attitude. Maybe we don't want to remain, so we get out. Well, I... I said, how to thwart God's building steadfastness in your life. A trial has come in your life, and depending on how you react to that is how much steadfastness will be grown in your life. We could have a bad attitude and complain about that trial. Oh, yeah, that will help grow steadfastness. Well, that stupid trial, get out of the way, cat. We don't have dogs at home. We got cats that always walk under feet, you know, so I kick them across. No, I don't do that. But I feel like it sometimes. We could just have a bad attitude and complain about that, tri that trial. We, when we do that, we thwart God's growing steadfastness in our life. Uh, we could get out from under that trial by any means possible, you know, resigning, getting out of there, not taking our load, not having anything to do with it. We could ignore what Scripture says about trials. You might go to the book of James and see what James says here, and you say, no, I don't believe it. I don't want to, I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather complain about my trial than to count it joy, you know, and, and we ignore what scripture says about it, and we maybe doubt God's ability to take you through the trial. These are ways that you can thwart. James says, let that steadfastness have its work. Let God build that in your life by having the proper attitude to realize that God is in control. God will give you grace. God will take you through. In fact, I have a cross-reference here. This is interesting. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 9. Did Paul ever go through trials? <laughs> yeah. Every town he went to to preach, you know, he'd get arrested and beaten and thrown in jail and all that. But he also had another trial in his life, a testing, a problem. We don't know what it is. There's Bible scholars who got their guesses, but this is what Paul says. So to keep me from being conceited, he's just gone through a story about how the Lord had, he says, in a vision or whether physically or in a vision, I do not know, Paul. And he was taken up to the third heaven and he saw marvelous things that can't be uttered. And, and, but, but then he says this, so to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Many Bible scholars believe it was blindness. At the end of one of his epistles, he says something about, you see, without such large handwriting, I write this, I sign this epistle. There was another uh, reference in one of Paul's epistles where he says, you would have even given me your very eyes as if their eyes were better than his eyes. And you remember when he was on the road to... To, um, and the Lord met him, um, he was blinded for a period of time, and then he was, he was, he, his sight as if scales fell off his eyes and he could see again. Some Bible scholars, they, we don't know. What, we don't know what this messenger of Satan was. But he says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And then he says, three times... I pleaded with the Lord about this. I want you to think about that word pleaded. It doesn't just say, well, Lord, you know, this thorn in the flesh is a little bit bothersome to me, so if, you know, if you're willing to take it away, that, that would be nice. <laughs> that isn't the way he brought it to the Lord. He pleaded with the Lord. Lord, I can't take this thorn in the flesh. I just plead that you would take it away from me. And he says he prayed that three times, that it should leave me. 
But he, the Lord, said to me, Nope, I'm going to leave that thorn in the flesh in your life. He says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you are a better servant with this thorn in the flesh because it keeps you dependent on me. God has purposes for trials. We can try, try to thwart those and the growth in our life. Last point, you're altering from those trials. He says this, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, you will have grown from it. Now, when you first read that, you say, perfect? None of us are perfect. I'll never be perfect until I get to heaven. Well, if you look at that word perfect, uh, the original language, it is teleos. And it can mean perfect, complete in all of its parts, full grown, of full age. It is many times used of the Christian life and it really doesn't mean that you are totally sinless anymore. I've grown to the point in my life where I don't ever sin anymore. You know? That isn't what that means. But it means mature. You've grown in your Christian life to become a mature uh, Christian. That you are, um, you've grown. You've grown to that point. So it doesn't necessarily mean perfect, but it means uh, mature especially the completeness of the Christian character. By the way, I put this in here, kind of at the end here, that word teleos is related to the word that Jesus used when he was on, dying on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, it is complete, it is perfected, it is matured. The whole plan of salvation has been taken care of with my death on the cross. Interesting. So, Paul, uh, Peter, uh, <laughs> Let me get my authors right. James says, let me go back to that. He says that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking nothing in your Christian life. God wants to grow your character. I have said this before. I, I say it more to myself than I say it to you. But listen to this. God is more concerned about your spiritual growth than he is that you go through a nice, easy life. God could allow us to go through a nice, easy life. God could allow us that everything goes right, the money's pouring in, the bills are all paid, I'm healthy, uh, everything's going fine. You know, God could make it so that that happens in our life. But God is more concerned about your spiritual growth, building of character, building of steadfastness that he allows these trials to come into your life. So, I've gone through that. All right, cross, oh, cross-reference, Philippians 1, 6. We looked at that just a few weeks ago. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. God has begun a work in us. When a person comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they trust in him, the Bible says they become born again. The Bible says they're at first they're a baby Christian and they need to grow and God uses his word. God uses the indwelling Holy Spirit and God uses the circumstances of life to grow you to become a mature and strong Christian. All right, here's the conclusion. How did I do? Oh, I did all right. We got, we got food downstairs and we're all hungry and... Uh, so let me go through this conclusion. What is your attitude toward problems and trials that, you, that meet you along the road of life? You need to consider that. I had to ball myself out this week. I don't think I handle problems very well. I get upset. I get angry. I need to learn to count it joy. How about you? Do you resent them? Do you get angry about them? They prove to you that God loves you and wants to grow you. If you consider that, hey, God brought this into my life so that I can grow. Why? Because he loves me. Oh, so take control. Count it. Take control over your emotions and attitude of those trials 
and count them as joy. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. I told Mike uh, we're not going to have a closing hymn so that because we got a whole bunch of stuff downstairs. So we will close in a word of prayer and then uh, start heading downstairs. And is it sexist to say something like, ladies, can you go help get set up downstairs? Ladies don't have to do all of that. Men, you can go down and get in that kitchen too and get everything set up and we'll uh, go down and eat uh, in just a little while. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us. And Father, I thank you that you bring trials into our lives so that we can grow from them. Father, may we have the right attitude as those trials come. Thank you, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.